Forget the quaint towns you find on postcards. Some places exist far beyond any map, shrouded in shadows and unsettling secrets. These are the disturbing small towns where whispers linger in the wind and a feeling of unease clings to the air. Why were they abandoned? What dark forces linger within their forgotten boundaries? Prepare to step off the familiar path and into the unknown. Starting off our list today, we have Athens, Texas, home to Reverend Fuller, who it seems took a dark turn the day the circus rolled into town. It is said that on that day, a wagon carrying a cargo of monkeys tipped over and the animals escaped into the woods, where some were later captured by Reverend Fuller. Locals tell that Fuller kept the monkeys in a cage on a plot of land he owned called Fuller Park, where eventually he began using them for highly unethical experimentation. It was said for years he tore the animals until they eventually died and were buried on the land. Later, when Fuller passed, he and his wife were buried in the park as well. Many locals who had heard the rumors of Fuller's heinous acts went out to explore the land driven by curiosity. Many also recounted that while exploring the area, they had found a series of entrances to underground tunnels, all of which eventually met up underground, forming the shape of a pentagram. It has also been said that the road leading into the park and the park itself, where the monkeys along with Fuller and his wife are buried is extremely haunted. Not by Fuller's ghost, but rather the ghost of the monkeys who had to endure the unforgiving nature of Fuller's torture under the guise of scientific exploration. Next, we have the tragedy of McCarthy, Alaska, an event that took place in 1983, in which a man named Hastings had planned to wipe out the entire population of the small town. About eight months prior to the incident, Hastings had moved to the small mining town that had a population of just 22 people. On February 29th, Hastings went over to his friend Chris Richards' home and fired two projectiles at the man. One hit him just above his eye and the other in the neck. Richards was, however, However, able to escape after defending himself with a kitchen blade and ran to get help. After firing at Richards, Hastings went to the airstrip where most of the town had gathered, awaiting the weekly mail delivery. He hit seven individuals with projectiles from a handheld weapon. Six passed and one suffered severe injury. When Hastings was eventually apprehended, 30 kilometers outside of the town, he admitted that he had planned on taking out the entire population but was ultimately unsuccessful. He had also wanted to hijack the mail plane so that he could fly to Glen Allen where he would steal a truck and blow himself up along with the Trans-Alaska Oil Pipeline Pump Station. Hastings was sentenced to 634 years in prison for his crimes. Next on our list today, we have San Geronimo de Juarez, Mexico, a town with a population of just 7,300 in which Oscar Flores took the lives of 12 individuals, including a member of his own family. The incident started in the man's home where he ended the life of his nephew with a kitchen blade. When police arrived on the scene, Flores was able to escape after he beat one officer with a large rock and stole the weapon off another. Flores then used that weapon to continue his violent rampage, firing at random people throughout the town. Eventually, the townspeople turned on Flores and began chasing him. While trying to outrun them, Flores lost the weapon he had stolen and somehow also lost his clothes. He faced off against the townspeople naked, armed with only a large blade, but when police arrived at the scene, they were able to successfully apprehend Flores, who was badly injured in the process and died in hospital not long after. After his death, it was discovered that seven years prior to his final violent spree, Flores, who had a long history of substance abuse, had taken the life of his brother-in-law, as well as five other individuals in Tijuana in the years prior. Next up, we have the 10 hour killing spree that took place in June of 2010 in the small villages of Cumbria in England. It all started early in the morning when 56-year-old taxi driver Derek Bird drove to his brother's home and fired 11 projectiles into his head using a handheld weapon. He then drove to the home of his family's tax agent, who he thought had been conspiring against him alongside his brother, and took the man's life in a similar fashion. After the incident, it seems as though Bird just snapped. He began driving through the villages and towns targeting fellow cattle drivers. One died and three were injured before the police caught wind. Somehow, however, Bird was able to avoid capture. He ditched the cops and continued driving to the next town where again he began firing at random people, ending the lives of another nine men and women and injuring another seven. Eventually, out of gas and out of ammo, missing his vehicle's front tire, Bird got out of his car and began walking into the woods. An hour later, police located his body and it was determined that the man, unable to live with his actions or perhaps face the consequences, 
had taken his own life. Next up on our list today, we have the small town of Luxeuil, located in France and home to just 130 residents. In 1989, it was resident Christian Dornier who landed the town on this list after a mental break led him to a two hour killing spree in which he ended the lives of 14 individuals. While the reality of the incident was shocking after the event took place, many of the locals admitted to having suspected such behavior was inevitable from Dornier. In fact, before the killings even took place, the town's council had suggested to Dornier's family that he should seek psychological help for his disposition. Unfortunately, the family did not listen to the council and on July 12th, Dornier fired a handheld weapon at his sister and then opened fire on his mother and father. Dornier then got in his car where he spent the next two hours driving around town firing his weapon at anyone who crossed his path. He was eventually caught by police after sustaining an injury from an officer's weapon. Dornier did survive the arrest and went to trial, but he was never convicted for his crimes. He was found not guilty by reason of insanity. In 1991, Dornier was checked into a psychiatric hospital in France where he remains to this day. Next up, we have the small town of Hungford, England, population 5,000. On August 10th of 1984, yet another two hour killing spree occurred that caused the death of seven 17 individuals, including the assailant's family dog, and it also badly injured 15 more. The killing started around 12 p.m. when Michael Robert Ryan abducted a woman from a local park, took her to a secluded area, and fired 13 projectiles at her, ending her life. Michael then fled the scene and made his way back to his neighborhood. When he arrived at his home, he ended the life of the family dog with a projectile and then began loading up his car with handheld weapons. He tried to leave, but his car wouldn't start, so out of anger, he grabbed a can of gasoline, soaked the house, and set it on fire. He then began walking down the road, aiming at anyone he saw. When his mother arrived on the scene, she yelled out to her son, begging him to stop and asking why he was doing what he was doing. He took her life and then fled the area. He eventually took his own life in an empty building that had been surrounded by law enforcement after Michael had been spotted inside. The incident changed the history of England, as shortly after this took place, the country implemented much stricter weapons laws. Next on our list today, we have the unsolved mystery of the Bedford, Massachusetts highway killings. In March of 1988, in the small town, which now has a population of around 13,000, young women started to go missing. The disappearances went on for months, but no one could figure out why they were happening. It wasn't until July of that same year that some clarity began to take place, when the bodies of 9 out of the 11 missing women were discovered along the town's highway. It was revealed that the women who had lost their lives all had ties to illegal substance distribution as well as SEX work. Authorities determined that foul play had led to the deaths and a case was opened in the hopes of locating the remaining two missing women and apprehending the killer or killers involved in the deaths of the discovered nine. Unfortunately, neither were ever found and to this day, the case remains an unsolved mystery that continues to baffle law enforcement and plague the small town of Bedford, Massachusetts. Next up and starting off our top three today, we have the small town of Burke Canyon in Idaho. The town was founded in 1887 after rich deposits of silver and lead had been discovered in the area. The architecture of the town was strange, as it had to accommodate the fact that the town had been built inside an incredibly thin canyon, which at some points was only 300 feet wide. But they made it work. For a while at least, as just a few years after the town opened its doors, it became devastated by an avalanche, which was quickly followed up by a labor strike. A labor strike that ended in a standoff between the miners and the mine owners, during which a projectile accidentally set off a large amount of dynamite, which caused a mill to explode and ended the lives of six people. A few years later, disgruntled miners deliberately blew up another mill, claiming the lives of even more. The incident were followed up by two massive natural fires, a major flood, and another large avalanche, causing the fall of Burke Canyon, which is known today as nothing much more than a ghost town with some odd buildings and a very violent past. Next up, we have Attica, New York. If the town sounds familiar, it might be because you are vaguely remembering stories you've heard about the town's prison with the same name, which, of course, is what landed the small town on today's list in the first place. The Attica Maximum Security Prison was home to many of the world's most influential 
infamous criminals, including American killer David Berkowitz, also known as the Son of Sam, who was responsible for at least eight deaths after which he consumed the flesh of his victims, and Mark David Chapman, the man who killed Beatles legend John Lennon. In 1971, the inmates of the prison, which had been known for its inhumane treatment of the prisoners, took control in an effort to negotiate for better living conditions. The state responded with extreme force, leading to the deaths of at least 34 inmates and nine hostages. Okay, this last town is Baltimore, Maryland, and while it's not small, what happened there is definitely shocking. Have you ever heard of Joe Menthe? Well, if you haven't, listen up, and if you're eating, put it down. Joe Menthe was an American serial killer who claimed to have been responsible for violating and ending the lives of 13 separate individuals. If right now you're wondering what he did with the bodies of the deceased, I will tell you, but I'm not happy about it. He made them into burgers and served those burgers to members of the public at his roadside open pit barbecue stand. He was arrested after he asked a friend to help him dispose of a body he had been hiding in a warehouse for over a month. The friend obviously reported him to the police and Joe was convicted of two killings despite confessing to 13. However, research did later confirm three more of his victims. Joe was sentenced to life without parole, thank God, and eventually died in his cell on August 5th of 2017 at the age of 62. Hannah, have you ever been to Britain before or the UK? I, I have. I went to Legoland, so how about you? Oh, sh**. I doubt Legoland's gonna appear on this list. <laughs> no, I don't. No. I don't think so. I don't think Legoland is a disturbing small town no. hiding no. pure evil. <laughs> but stay tuned to find out what R is. <laughs> Starting off our list today, we have Beachy Head, located in Eastbourne, UK, and home to the Beachy Head Cliff, aka the highest Chalksea Cliff in Britain. Standing at 162 meters, 530 feet above sea level. The area is beautiful, but it hides an incredibly dark secret. Since 1965, at least 500 people have died at the cliffs. One notable death would have to be that of Jessie Earle, who was found in 1983 at the base of the cliffs, nine years after she disappeared. While many deaths that have occurred at Beachy Head relate to either accident or intentional self-inflicted harm, this particular death was ruled as a killing, as clear signs of foul play were more than evident. Jessie's assailant remains a mystery, but her parents strongly believe that her death was orchestrated by Peter Tobin, a serial killer who had lived in the area at the time of Jessie's disappearance. Due to lack of evidence and the level of decomposition on the body and lack of DNA, police were never able to link Tobin to the crime, but considering the fact that Tobin was a diagnosed psychopath who enjoyed violating and ending the lives of young women and who claims to have taken the lives of over 48 women, I'd say there's a high possibility that he was in fact the culprit in this particular situation too. Next up on our list today we have Mullinakill in Northern Ireland. I'm sorry I probably absolutely butchered that. Northern Ireland is full of ancient legends and superstitions but the small village of Mullinakill is home to one of my personal favorite spooky tales. The Headless Horse. Not the Headless Horseman, the Headless Horse. This story starts off during the period of the Napoleonic Wars, so between 1803 and 1815. During this time, Sir William Verner, who hailed from Mullenakill and was a soldier, headed off to fight in the battle, and when he left, he brought with him his favorite horse, Constantine. Sadly, during the battle, Constantine the horse lost his head. That would be absolutely devastating to witness, and that is exactly how Sir William felt. Of course, his trusted steed deserved a proper send-off, so William brought the body back home with him to lay the horse to rest, and as they say, well, the rest is history. Hundreds of years later, locals report the sound of ghostly hooves echoing throughout the village and surrounding area at night, said to be the ghost of Constantine still riding through the village. Next up, we have the underside of Buckinghamshire, England, or more like underground, I guess. You see, in Buckinghamshire, if you look hard enough, you will find an old, unassuming church accompanied by a mausoleum, surrounded by fields of lush green grass. But if you look even harder, 
You will find that beneath that church lies a series of underground tunnels and chambers that once belonged to the Hellfire Club. No, not the group from Stranger Things, but a secret society created by the Duke of Wharton in 1718. By the 1750s, however, there was a new main man in town by the name of Sir Francis Dashwood, and he founded his very own Hellfire Club and built the tunnels as a secret meeting place for its members. So what went on below the earth of the countryside? No one exactly knows. It's a secret club, obviously, and all the records of the club were actually burned when the secretary died. But it is believed and it has been speculated that the tunnels were used for various debaucherous activities such as SEX parties, pagan rituals, satanic worship, and even human sacrifice. If you go down there, let me know uh, if it's haunted, if you find any sigils, just let me know in the comments if you've been. Next on our list today, we have Stirling, Scotland. Stirling is a beautiful market town located in central Scotland that is surrounded by incredible farmland. And while it is filled with amazing tales from history, it is also full of creepy tales of ghostly hauntings as well. You cannot visit Stirling without seeing the incredible Stirling Castle, which sits right on top of a hill. And it is here that we start our ghostly tour. The castle is said to be the home of many ghosts, the most famous of which is likely the Green Lady, who is said to have lost her life while saving Mary Queen of Scots from a fire. Others say that Queen Mary herself haunts the castle and can be seen wandering the grounds while wearing a pink dress. It's so weird how like women ghosts, they're always like, it's the white lady, it's the green lady, it's the pink lady. I don't know why, it's just weird. Anyways, that was just me noticing that. Aside from the castle, there are more haunting tales that come from a more likely place, the Darnley Coffee House on Bow Street. This place is said to be haunted by quite a mischievous ghost, which sounds like I don't know, a bit of a nightmare, especially if you're trying to run a small business. There's also a ghost that is said to still linger at the Old Town Jail, and he is said to be the earthbound spirit of the last man executed for his crimes at the site. It's safe to say that Sterling is full of beautiful places, creepy tales, and a ton of fascinating history. Next on our list, we have Pendle Village, located in Lancashire. Way back in the 1700s, under the rule of King James Britain, was particularly opposed to the idea of witches, witchcraft, and women with an education. Anyways, the small village of Pendle gained notoriety as a hotspot for witches in 1612 after a young woman named Alison, not Alison, that's Alison with a Z, device, had placed a curse on a traveling salesman. Alison had been begging on the side of the road when the salesman passed by. She asked him for some pins for whatever reason, but he refused. And so she cursed him, and he immediately became paralyzed and fell onto the ground. Okay, so I know usually these stories are like, she can do math, burn her, she's a witch, but like, this kind of sounds pretty legit. Anyways, she was arrested, along with nine others accused of practicing witchcraft. In August, all ten of them were taken to the gallows, and among them were Alison, a woman named Alice Nutter, five other young women, two men, and one elderly woman in her 80s. Coming up next, we have St. Osith, which is located in Essex. This small Essex village has quite a disturbing history, beginning with the story of Princess Osith herself. Princess Osith was the daughter of a Mercian king and was said to have been raised in a nunnery. She later became an abbess and founded a convent in what is now St. Osith, Essex. According to legend, Osith was martyred by Danish invaders who took her head. I guess that's a theme with me today, which is kind of a little unsettling. This legend states that after this event, she picked up her head and walked to the door of the nunnery, where she finally collapsed and died. Pretty badass, and that is exactly what led to the creepy tales of today. It is said that the ghost of Princess Osith wanders the grounds of St. Osith Priory, the site where her convent once stood. Her apparition is typically described as carrying her head under her arm, reliving the moment of her martyr in perpetual haunting. There is also a holy well in St. Osith said to have sprung up where she fell after her execution. The well became a pilgrimage site and it's believed to have healing properties. Some local lore suggests that the area around the well is also haunted by Osith's spirit who continues to guard the waters. This is only the beginning somehow of the horrifying tales though, as later in the 16th and 17th centuries, this place was the site 
of witch trials, where many women were convicted and executed on the grounds of being accused of being witches. You know, could do like four plus four and suddenly you're a witch. One final thing I'll say about St. Osith is that this site is also said to contain Britain's most haunted home known as The Cage. This house has seen many owners over the years, none of which have stayed long before being driven out of the house by a very violent presence. They should put that thing on Airbnb and just see what happens. I'd stay there, why not? One night? What are you gonna do, ghosty? Next up we have Wickington, Staffordshire. Honestly, the names of these towns are pure gold. What goes on in them? Not so much. This particular town is home to a particularly gruesome killing that took place in June 1972. One evening, a young woman by the name of Judith Roberts decided to go for a bike ride. She said goodbye to her mother, headed out the front door, hopped on her little green bicycle, and made her way down a quiet country lane. She was never seen alive again. Sometime after she set out on her bike ride, she was snatched and killed by blunt force. Her body was hidden in a field. There was a soldier living in the town at the time of Judith's death, Andrew Evans, who had been obsessed with the young woman. In fact, he even admitted to having vivid dreams about ending her life. And after she died, Evans went to the police station to request photos of the crime scene, and he ended up confessing to being the killer, but he later withdrew his statement and accused the police of using a sedative on him in order to obtain a false confession. His conviction was overturned and he received almost one million pounds in compensation. For those who are not British, pounds are money. Judith's death was never solved, but some people believe she was killed by Peter Sutcliffe, aka the Yorkshire Ripper, who in 1981 received 20 life sentences for ending the lives of at least 13 separate women in the area, so not a far stretch. Next up on our list today we have Pluckley in Kent. The village of Pluckley, which I just said, located in the county of Kent in England, is known for being one of the most haunted villages in the entire country. There are numerous ghost stories associated with the village, many of which have been passed down through generations. One of the most famous tales is that of the Screaming Woods, a dense forest area on the outskirts of the village. According to legend, the woods are haunted by the ghost of a highwayman who was caught and killed by villagers, and his screams can still be heard at night. That's absolutely chilling. Another famous ghost story involves the watercress woman. We had the green lady, the pink one, we got the watercress woman now. A ghostly figure who is said to appear near a stream in the village carrying a basket of watercress on her arm. It is believed that she lost her life in the stream while picking watercress and her ghost has been seen by many villagers over the years. Other reported sightings include ghosts of a monk, a schoolmaster, and even a haunted pub. Despite the spooky tales, Pluckley remains a charming and picturesque village, attracting visitors from all over the world. So, uh, visit if you dare, alright? A ghost and a pint. Next up, Fairnew Fellum in Hertfordshire. On January 7th of 2004, Robert Workman, an 83-year-old lieutenant, was killed at point-blank range, you know what that means, standing in the doorway of his home. Robert was killed by Christopher Puchin, who had been hired to remove a wasp's nest from the retired lieutenant's home. But it wasn't until after Christopher was arrested for an unrelated killing that his crimes against Robert were revealed. Four years after, in 2006, Christopher was arrested for killing a man named Fred. Fred was backpacking across Europe when he was lured into a field and killed, also at point blank range, also by Christopher, who then cut up Fred's body, placed it in trash bags, and set it on fire. While serving time for this crime, Christopher had revealed to a cellmate that he had been the one to kill Robert back in 2004. Not only that, but he had entered into a sexual relationship with Robert before doing so, and the reason he did it was because he was offered compensation for his hand in the elderly man's death. Talk about no loyalty amongst killers. He's not really a thief, so talk about it. Finally on our list today we have Glencoe Argyll. Glencoe is a beautiful and rugged valley located in the Argyll region of Scotland and is pretty famous for being one of the settings in the Bond film Skyfall, but it's also famous for its haunting tale. The area is steeped in history and it all starts back in 1692 with what is known as the Massacre of Glencoe. In that year, soldiers loyal to the English crown killed members of the Macdonald clan 
clan who had been hosting them as guests. It's giving Game of Thrones. It is said that the ghosts of the lost McDonald's still haunt the valley, seeking revenge on their killers. Fair enough. Another famous tale is that of the Grey Man. Here we are again. Oh my god. According to legend, the Grey Man is a ghostly figure who is said to haunt the summits of the mountains in Glencoe. His ghostly presence has been reported by many climbers and hikers over the years. Louisiana's oldest town, Nacogdoches, is known for its stunning historic district and beautiful Cane River, but it also harbors a darker past. Among the most whispered about sites is the Magnolia Plantation, where some claim to hear the clanking of chains from the days of slavery and see ghostly figures in the fields at night. Another notable location is the haunted Bullard Mansion, where the apparition of a sorrowful woman is said to wander the rooms, mourning a tragic loss from centuries ago. Along the Cane River, locals and visitors have reported unexplained lights and shadowy figures, suggesting a lingering presence of those who once lived and died in this historic town. These tales only contribute to the town's reputation as a place where the past is never entirely at rest. Next up today, we have Old Algiers. Just across the Mississippi River from the French Quarter, Old Algiers is one of the oldest parts of New Orleans and exudes a quaint yet mysterious charm. Its history of maritime disasters, battles, and yellow fever epidemics has given rise to numerous ghost stories. Legends tell of spirits from different eras wandering its locales, notably the haunted Algiers Courthouse, where visitors often report eerie sensations and fleeting shadows that defy explanation. Similarly, at Algiers Point, the oldest part of the neighborhood, phantom footsteps and ghostly apparitions are not uncommon. Some believe these hauntings are the souls of those affected by the area's tumultuous events, unable to find peace, forever imprinting their presence on old Algiers' historical canvas. Next up today, we have Gretna. Gretna is situated on the west bank of the Mississippi River, and it is a small town with a historic district that seems to hold secrets of the past. Among its most eerily enchanting sites is the Gretna Green Blacksmith Shop, an establishment steeped in folklore and whispered tales. Legend has it that the spirits of blacksmiths and patrons from bygone eras continue to inhabit this place. Their presence felt through disembodied clanks of metal and fleeting shadows, and it's said that these spectral figures are not just remnants of the past, but guardians of stories untold, making this shop a focal point for those intrigued by the paranormal and the town's mysterious history. Next up today, we have St. Francisville. St. Francisville has definitely carved its niche in the realm of the paranormal with the infamous Myrtle's Plantation, a place we have spoken about many times here on the channel, and it is often cited as one of America's most haunted homes. This grand estate is of course steeped in eerie legends and is said to be haunted by the spirits of former inhabitants who met tragic fates. Among the chilling tales are those of a young girl who appears in the windows, spectral voices that echo through the hallways at night and inexplicable cold spots that move across rooms. Visitors and staff have reported encounters with apparitions and unexplained phenomena, only adding layers of intrigue and a lot of fear to the plantation's already dark history. Next up on our list today, we have Materi, a suburb of New Orleans, and this place has its share of ghost stories, especially in the older parts of the town. The cemetery there has very elaborate tombs and statues, and of course, it is said to be haunted. The cemetery's atmosphere, particularly at dusk, lends itself to the spine-chilling tales recounted by those who visit. Some speak of seeing ghostly apparitions or spectral lights weaving through the tombs, while others report the unsettling feeling of being watched or followed. The intricate mausoleums and ornate statues, some of which commemorate prominent figures from Louisiana's history, seem to hold their own secrets, contributing to the cemetery's mysterious aura. Legends suggest that the spirits of those interred within these grand vaults are restless, perhaps disturbed by the living or clinging to their earthly ties. Such stories have cemented the cemetery's reputation as not just a final resting place, but a locale where the past and the present, the tangible and the ethereal, eerily intersect. Next up today, we have Chalmette. 
the Chalmette Battlefield and National Cemetery. These are the hallowed grounds where the pivotal battle of New Orleans took place, and it holds a deep historical and supernatural resonance. The spectral encounters reported here are not just limited to visual apparitions, but many visitors claim to hear the distant clash of arms, the urgent drum beats, and the anguished cries of soldiers echoing through the turmoil of the 1815 battle. These auditory hauntings are particularly potent on foggy mornings or late evenings, creating an atmosphere that feels kind of suspended in time. Not only this, but the cemetery, final resting place for many soldiers, is said to have its own eerie ambiance. People have reported sudden temperature drops and even the feeling of being watched, suggesting that the spirits of those who fought and fell are still tethered to this place of memory and loss, especially around the anniversary of the battle. Next up today we have Jean Lafitte. Is it Jean or Jean? Let me know. This small town named after the infamous pirate is steeped in legends and lore, with many believing that Jean Lafitte's spirit still lingers. Locals and visitors whisper about ghostly pirates wandering the marshes, sometimes seen from the corner of the eye, vanishing when approached. The lore suggests that these ghosts are protectors of hidden treasures, still guarding their loot even in death. The dense fog that often blankets the area adds a kind of visual mystique giving the town an almost ethereal quality at night. Amid this fog, mysterious lights are sometimes seen moving through the trees, described by some as the lanterns of Jean Lafitte's crew, searching for something lost, or perhaps signaling to lost souls. Next up today we have Thibodeau. With deep roots in the sugarcane industry, this town not only bears the scars of its tumultuous past, but also carries the weight of its ghostly legacies. The Thibodeau Massacre, an event of racial violence, Violence is a very dark chapter in the town's history, and it is believed to have left an indelible mark on the area, with many claiming that the unrested souls of the victims still roam the town. The air seems thick with the echoes of the past, particularly at night when the boundaries between eras blur. Visitors and residents report chilling encounters with apparitions in period clothing, inexplicable sounds, and a pervasive sense of unease in certain areas. These phantoms are most often sighted near historic sites tied to the massacre, as well as along the shadowy banks of the bayous where the water whispers of old sorrows. Such tales only contribute to Thibodeau's reputation as a place where history lives on, not just in books and memories, but palpably in the very atmosphere. Moving on down today, we have Frenier. Nestled near the mysterious waters of Lake Pontchartrain, this place carries a haunting legacy amplified by its tragic history of natural disasters and eerie local folklore. The town's past is marred by catastrophic hurricanes that have decimated the community, leading to tales of lost souls and restless spirits that linger in this devastated landscape. Only adding to its mystique, Frenier is shrouded in tales of voodoo practices and curses believed by some to be intertwined with the town's misfortunes. The desolate ghost town ambiance is palpable, with abandoned structures and overgrown vegetation reinforcing this sense of abandonment and otherworldliness. Visitors and lovers of the paranormal are drawn to Frenier's secluded setting, where the whispering winds and lapping waters seem to echo with the troubled past and spectral residents. And finally on our list today we have Mandeville. Across Lake Pontchartrain from New Orleans, Mandeville has its own tales of the paranormal. Among the most talked about ghostly legends is the tale of the Mandeville Lakefront, where apparitions are said to wander the shores, especially on foggy nights, which seems to be a bit of a theme among these Louisiana places. Some locals recount seeing figures that suddenly vanish, leaving only footprints in the sand or the sound of disembodied whispers behind them. In the heart of Mandeville, historic buildings stand, and it's within these structures that many of the town's paranormal stories find their roots. For instance, there are accounts of spectral figures seen gazing out of windows, only to disappear when approached. Others have reported unexplained sounds like footsteps or muted conversations echoing through empty rooms or hallways. These occurrences have fueled a sense of intrigue and mystery, making Mandeville a place where the past seems to intersect with the present in the most eerie of ways. We're going to kick things off with Loveland. 
How on earth did I not put Loveland, Ohio in part one? Loveland is home to one of the strangest creatures said to stalk the state, the Loveland Frog. But it's also home to a supposedly haunted castle. Loveland Castle was constructed by Harry Andrews. A uh, very interesting man this guy was. He had a lot of interest in knights and medieval lore. Andrews was born in 1890. He worked as a medic during World War I. He then contracted meningitis during the war and was believed to be dead. His body was actually moved to the morgue, like he was done. But when his body was taken back to the hospital to be dissected, the doctors were like, hey, you know what, why not? Let's just see if we can get his heart beating again with adrenaline. Miraculously, it worked. Andrews, who'd now spent a whole bunch of time in Europe and then almost died, was now even more into medieval history and returned home with this newfound determination to build his very own castle. Eventually, he constructed Loveland Castle along the banks of the Little Miami River. Andrews then moved into the castle, where he lived until he died in 1981. Today, the castle is the headquarters for the Knights of the Golden Trail, an organization Andrews started dedicated to upholding the principles of knighthood, but Harry Andrews' spirit is said to still roam the castle grounds. Objects will mysteriously disappear or move, and voices are heard echoing through the corridors. And as I said at the top, of course, Loveland's supernatural reputation doesn't end with this castle. One of the most famous legends is that of the Loveland Frog, or frogs. There have been multiple large frog-like creatures spotted near the Little Miami River over the years. Next up, we have Ashtabula, which is said to be haunted by the spirits of a tragic train disaster. So on December 29th, 1876, the Pacific Express No. 5 crossed the Ashtabula Bridge. But because of particularly cold weather and structural weaknesses, the bridge collapsed, sending the train plummeting into the icy river below. And in the end, 98 people died. The scene must have been absolutely horrific, with rail cars crashing into each other and igniting in flame. And firefighters were unable to put out the flames, so people just cried out in pain and horror as they were consumed by fire, trapped in the wreckage. It was one of the worst rail accidents in US history, and the screams of those victims still haunt the area to this day. Some say you can occasionally hear them above the rush of the river. The Chestnut Grove Cemetery holds the remains of 19 of these victims, but their spirits are said to be very much active. Visitors to the cemetery have reported seeing ghostly apparitions. But along with the victims of the tragedy, there's also said to be the ghost of Charles Collins, one of the developers of the bridge. Witnesses claim to have seen his guilty spirit weeping at the sight of the tragedy or crying over people's graves. Some claim to see tiny lights even hovering below the new bridge where the old one once stood. Rogue's Hollow near Doylestown, Ohio has its fair share of spooky tales as well. It's said that a mill worker died in a pretty gruesome manner, getting crushed by the mill wheel, and now his spirit is said to guard the area, keeping outsiders at bay. Then there's the eerie tale of the headless horse and the ghost oak tree. So at one time there was a large oak tree near Route 65, and one of its branches hung so low that riders on horseback had to duck as they passed under it. Well, one story goes that the branch was weighed down extra low with ice, and a poor horse just ran into it at top speed, lobbing off its head. From that point on, riders passing the area late at night would occasionally come across a devilish figure riding a ghostly, headless horse. Next up, we have Oxford, Ohio, which has one of the coolest ghosts, a phantom motorcyclist. So the story goes that back in the 40s, there was this farmer's daughter. She was head over heels for this guy it was a bit of a James Dean type leather jacket, motorcycle, very rebellious. Also a lot like me, minus the motorcycle, the leather jacket, and the rebellious part. His name was James, that's the similarity. And her father was not too thrilled about their relationship. He thought the guy 
was trouble, and he probably wasn't wrong. He forbade his daughter from seeing him, so to avoid her father's disapproval, they met up in complete secret, usually late at night when the coast was clear, and when it was, the girlfriend would flash the porch light three times as a signal for him to come over. Well, one night, the boyfriend decided he wanted to take their relationship to the next level and propose. He saw the three flashes and revved up his motorcycle, racing towards her house to pop the question, but as soon as he sped down the road, he lost control of his bike, crashing into a barbed wire fence. And ever since, people claim they've seen this mysterious light flickering in the distance along the road where he crashed, said to be the spirit of the phantom motorcyclist, still trying to reach his girl's house to ask for her hand in marriage. Next on the list is Chillicothe, where there were a series of mysterious disappearances between 2014 and 2015. Now, it all began in the spring of 2014 when Charlotte Trago vanished without a trace. Trago, uh, who had struggled with addiction, was a mother of two, and she remains missing to this day. Shortly after Trago's disappearance, another woman, Tamika Lynch, who was a friend of Trago's, went missing as well. Her body was discovered three weeks later by kayakers. It's pretty obvious there was foul play, but the official cause of her death was deemed inconclusive. Then there was the disappearance of Wanda Lemons in November of 2014. She's also never been found. On Christmas Day 2014, Shasta Hemelrick went missing. Her body was later recovered from the Scioto River. Authorities claim she took her own life, but her family, as well as many others, think someone took it from her. Then there was the disappearance and discovery of Tiffany Sayers' body in May 2015. Her remains were found in a creek covered by a sheet. And the final victim, Timberly Claytora's body, was found near an abandoned building. She died at the hands of a firearm. And the case just would have been handled completely differently if these women hadn't been battling addiction. That was the one thing connecting all these. They were all involved in that world. And there's just this kind of lax attitude when it comes to situations like this, unfortunately, where authorities are like, well, you know, they're part of that world. This is just what happens. So it really hasn't got the attention that it deserves. Now we move on to the town of Lancaster. Here, there used to be a home with an incredibly dark past, the Mudhouse Mansion. So the mansion's origins go back to the mid 19th century when it was built as a grand estate for a wealthy family. But as time went on, the home fell into disrepair and eventually it was abandoned and left to decay. And over the years, all these urban legends started to form around it. One of the most infamous stories is that the family had actually died in the mansion. Some versions of the tale claim that they were killed by an unknown assailant. Others go that they'd been driven to madness by some sinister force lurking within the mansion's walls. The Mudhouse Mansion was even said to be the birthplace of Bloody Mary herself. The mansion was demolished in 2015, but some folks will still claim to see ghostly figures of the mansion's former residents wandering the grounds, forever trapped in a limbo between the worlds of the living and the dead. All right, one of the strangest unsolved mysteries in Ohio has to be the Circleville Letters case. Now I'm gonna paraphrase here because there's a lot of detail. We could probably do an entire video about this case alone. But I'll go over it. It all started in 1976. Residents of Circleville started receiving these unsettling, threatening letters containing all these intimate details of their personal lives. The letters were postmarked from Columbus, Ohio, but there was no return address. One of the receivers of these letters was Mary Gillespie, a bus driver. She was accused in one of these letters of having an affair with the school superintendent and the letters just kept coming in from this unknown sender. Then Mary's husband, Ron, also became a target. He received a chilling ultimatum to end his wife's supposed affair or face dire consequences, death. Ron was found dead in his pickup truck after a mysterious phone call, which had seemingly confirmed his suspicion about the letter writer's identity. He'd left in his pickup truck with a firearm, but was found dead soon after having crashed into a tree. Now, authorities ruled Ron's death an accident, 
But then the letters continued. A number of residents received letters saying that Sheriff Dwight Radcliffe, who had investigated Ron's death, had been involved in a cover-up. At one point, this mysterious writer even planted threatening signs along Mary Gillespie's bus route, one of which she went to take down, only to find out it had been booby-trapped. If Mary had pulled the sign down in a particular way, a small pistol would have fired at her. Now, one man was arrested, Paul Freshor, but it's never been 100% verified that he was behind these letters. Eventually, he got out on parole. Case is still a mystery to this day. In the Hills and Dales Metro Park in Kittering, Ohio, there's a structure with a very shadowy past. The Haunted Witch's Tower, also known as Frankenstein's Castle. It was completed in 1941, and this 30-foot tall tower was constructed by boys with the National Youth Administration using salvaged stone. Its purpose was to provide panoramic views of the Community Country Club, with its lookout platform offering vistas stretching up to 15 miles. But because of how remote the tower is, a lot of young hooligans started flocking there in the 60s. Graffiti covered its walls, and bottles of liquor and beer cans littered the grounds. Even shingles torn from the roof and glass bottles became ammo for attacks on passing cars below on Peterson Boulevard. Then in 1967, during a thunderstorm, a young woman named Peggy Harmison sought shelter inside the tower with her boyfriend, Ronnie Stevens. Bad move. Lightning struck the tower, killing Peggy instantly. Her body was found on the 11th step, half covered in severe burns. Ronnie survived, but he was found in a state of uncontrollable shock, apparently running around screaming. And ever since that night, there have been stories about the ghost of Peggy haunting the tower. All right, let's switch things up with a haunted golf club. You don't hear about haunted golf clubs very often. Legend has it that in the 60s, a bride fell from a balcony at Oakhurst Golf Club in Grove City, Ohio. And her ghost is said to haunt the establishment to this very day. One of the most frequently reported sightings involves the ghostly figure of a woman dressed in white, believed to be the ghost of the bride. The upstairs kitchen, located near the ballroom where events are held, is said to be a hotspot for paranormal activity. Employees have reported hearing unexplained sounds of pots and pans clanging and knocking late at night, only to discover that items have been mysteriously rearranged by morning. All right, we're finishing things off today with, with Minerva. It all began in August of 1978, when the Caton family reported encountering a strange creature near their home. According to the Catons, they were enjoying a quiet evening when they heard unusual noises coming from outside. They came face to face with this towering ape-like creature standing over seven feet tall. The creature reportedly had shaggy dark fur covering its body, had glowing red eyes, and emitted this foul odor. The Catons quickly ran back to the safety of their home and phoned the cops. In the days that followed, all these other sightings of a mysterious creature were reported by other residents of Minerva. Witnesses described similar encounters with a large, hairy beast lurking in the shadows, but none of the stories were scarier than the Catons, who said the creature returned to their property several times, hurling rocks at their home, staring at them through their kitchen window, and even killing their dog. It's uh, one of the most violent Bigfoot cases ever reported. We're going to start the list with Waynesville, Ohio. This is said to be one of the most haunted towns in the state, which is saying a lot for Ohio. Waynesville, Ohio is founded way back in 1797, and it has quite the history and its fair share of spooky stories. So sure, folks flock here for the antiques and the annual sauerkraut festival, but it's also known as a haunt for ghost hunters. You'll hear some odd sounds in the old buildings. You'll see shadowy figures peeking out of windows. With more than 15 spots rumored to be haunted, Waynesville has no shortage of creepy tales, like the Hamill House Inn, for example. Staff here have reported seeing a mysterious man in room four, and some say a young salesman vanished there ages ago, possibly meeting a dark end. Then there's the Stetson House, where Louisa Stetson, Lyric, supposedly still roams, dressed to the nines in old-fashioned gear. There's also the former friend's boarding home, now a museum where you might hear the sounds of ladies bustling about as if they're cooking up a storm, even though there's no kitchen. 
anymore. Now we move on to Mansfield, Ohio. This place isn't just said to be haunted by, you know, lame ghosts who will just pass right through your body if they ever try to punch you. It's also haunted by a big, scary, hairy, orange-eyed beast referred to as Orange Eyes. And you wouldn't want to get punched by Orange Eyes. But let's start with the haunted stuff. One of the most famous haunted locations in Mansfield is the Ohio State Reformatory. Known for its imposing architecture and eerie atmosphere, once a prison, the reformatory is said to be haunted by the spirits of former inmates who suffered under harsh conditions. Visitors have reported strange noises, apparitions, and unsettling feelings while exploring it. And aside from the reformatory, Mansfield is also home to, again, tales of a cryptid known as the Orange Eyes. Described as a creature with glowing orange eyes and a menacing presence, sightings of the Orange Eyes have been reported in the wooded areas surrounding the city. Some believe it to be a Bigfoot-like creature. Others think it could be paranormal in some way. Some even believe it to be extraterrestrial in origin. Next up, we have Boston Mills, aka Helltown. This is kind of like the Chernobyl of Ohio. So Helltown, Ohio, within the boundaries of Boston Township is full, and I do mean full, of eerie legends and ghost stories. It was once a thriving community known as Boston Mills, but this area faced an abrupt evacuation in the early 70s at the hands of the U.S. government, purportedly to establish the Cuyahoga Valley National Park. Now the empty homes, the abandoned buildings, and desolate streets that are left behind have this eerie vibe about them. You see, some locals insist that the evacuation wasn't solely because of the government's land claim. There are stories about much darker reasons. Apparently there was toxic contamination with contaminants seeping into the soil. There are also stories about mutated animals and even people lingering around in the old abandoned homes. Not only that, but after the evacuation happened, there are said to have been satanic rituals carried out in the abandoned town. So, lots going on. Next up, we have Athens, Ohio, which has multiple haunted spots. There's a haunted abandoned asylum, a haunted cemetery, even the university is haunted. And there's more cemeteries, which are also all haunted. Every place in this town has ghosts. Half the population who lives here aren't even alive. Now, the haunted reputation mostly comes from its history with the former Athens Lunatic Asylum, now known as the Ridges, which is actually part of Ohio University's campus. The asylum's grounds still have old cemeteries where former patients were buried. One of the creepiest stories about the asylum is the story of Margaret Schilling. She was a former resident who died in the attic in 1979, and she was left there for so long that her decomposing body left a stain on the floor that remains to this very day. Wilson Hall, a dorm on Ohio University's campus, is rumored to be built on top of an old cemetery. The fourth floor of Wilson Hall is said to be haunted, with reports of apparitions, strange noises, and slamming doors. There's also a rumor about a student who took their own life in one of the rooms there. In addition to the Ridges and Wilson Hall, several cemeteries in the Athens area are rumored to be haunted, including Sims, Haynes, Hanning, Cuckler, Higgins, Zion, Hunter, Slaughter, quite the name for a cemetery, Cutler, Mansfield, and Peach Ridge Cemetery. Some say these cemeteries are actually arranged in the shape of a pentagram with Wilson Hall right at the center. Next, we have Kirtland, Ohio, which doesn't have much of a reputation of being haunted itself. What it does have, though, is a reputation for mutated creatures that are said to stalk the forests. Creatures known as melon heads. Deep within its dense forests are tales of the mysterious and eerie creatures known as the melon heads. According to local lore, the melon heads are said to be humanoid beings with these abnormally large bulbous hairless heads resembling melons. I picture them kind of looking a bit like Hey Arnold, which would be a lot less cute in real life. Uh, these elusive creatures are rumored to lurk in the shadows of the forests, emerging only under cover of darkness to stalk unsuspecting travelers. Now, there are a few different versions of the Melon Head's tale, but the most well-known story or explanation for these creatures was that a mad doctor was conducting unethical experiments on a bunch of orphans. Experiments which caused their bulbous craniums to uh, take shape. At one point, the orphans got fed up with being experimented on, and they hated their melon bulbous dumb heads, and they banded together, 
killing the mad scientist before setting his home on fire and running off into the woods. Sightings and encounters of melon heads, though, continue to be reported to this day. Cleveland is also said to have some creepy paranormal stuff going on, mostly from the supposedly haunted Franklin Castle, which is said to be Ohio's most haunted house. The Franklin Castle is a towering structure with a dark and mysterious past. Built in the late 19th century, Franklin Castle has long been rumored to be haunted by restless spirits. Stories of tragedy, death, and mystery surround it. Legend has it that the castle's original owner, Haynes Tideman, suffered multiple personal losses within its walls, leading to rumors of curses and supernatural stuff going on. Pretty soon after his family moved in, Tideman's mother died. His sister then died of diabetes, and over the next three years, more and more of his siblings died prematurely. Only two of the six actually made it to adulthood, so it's really no wonder why the place is said to have some darkness lingering in it. Over the years, visitors and residents have reported strange sounds, apparitions, and unexplained phenomena within the castle. Despite renovations and changes in ownership, one thing has always stayed the same, the paranormal activity. Next up on the list is Put-In Bay. Now, Put-In Bay, Ohio may be known for its sunny shores and summer fun, but lurking beneath the surface, there's some creepy stuff going on. From what I've read, there are three major haunted hotspots. First up, we have the Park Hotel. This hotel has stood since the late 1800s, and it's seen its fair share of guests come and go also means there's a lot of history, some of it dark. Some visitors have reported more than just creaky floorboards and old-fashioned charm. Rumor has it that the Park Hotel is haunted by the ghost of a young woman who tragically fell to her death from one of the upper floors. Guests have reported strange noises, flickering lights, and even sightings of a figure wandering the halls late at night. Next, there's the Dollar House, a Victorian mansion. Legend has it that the original owner, Valentine Dollar, was involved in some shady dealings during Prohibition, including smuggling alcohol and hiding it in secret passages throughout the house. And today, visitors claim to hear whispers and footsteps echoing through the empty rooms, as if the ghosts of Dollar's past are still lingering within the walls. Then there's the Crew's Nest, a historic home that sits on a cliff overlooking Lake Erie. This mansion was once owned by Jay Cook a banker and financier, but there's a tragic tale of one of Cook's daughters that's left its mark on the property. The story goes that the young girl fell to her death from one of the windows, and her ghost is said to still haunt the grounds, appearing as a fleeting figure in white. Moving on to Marietta, Ohio next, a charming town that also has its fair share of ghost stories, and most of the scary stuff happens at Hotel Lafayette. This hotel was built in the late 1800s. Over the years, guests and staff report reported strange occurrences and unexplained phenomena while staying there, leading many to believe that the hotel is haunted by spirits. One of the most famous ghostly residents of the Hotel Lafayette is said to be a woman named Sarah, who reportedly took her own life in one of the rooms, and guests have reported hearing disembodied cries, footsteps, and even seeing apparitions wandering the halls late at night. Others have claimed to feel an eerie presence or sudden drops in temperature, but Sarah isn't the only ghost rumored to haunt the Hotel Lafayette. Some guests have reported encountering the spirit of a young girl who plays tricks on unsuspecting visitors by moving objects or flickering lights. A real brat of a ghost. But at least she's still having fun in the afterlife, so props to her. Next up, we have another kind of Chernobyl-like Ohio small town, Cheshire. Only a handful of people still call this place home. At one time, this was a bustling town, but barely anyone lives there at this point, and that's because of the environmental hazards caused by a nearby power plant. The plant emitted a thick, sooty residue and chemical fogs that would blanket the town sporadically. Obviously, not at all uh, safe for residents to live in that kind of condition, so many abandoned their homes and started new lives in other places. Eventually, the power company responsible for the pollution was compelled to just buy out the entire town. But finally, we have the abandoned town of Moonville. Love that name, Moonville. This is a ghost town with only a few traces left behind. A cemetery, some foundations, and a desolate railroad tunnel. But what sets Moonville apart are the chilling tales that surround its abandoned tunnel. Stories that have been passed down for decades. One of the most famous specters haunting Moonville is that of Theodore Lawhead, the unfortunate engineer whose spirit is said to roam the tracks. Back in the 1880s, Lawhead met a tragic end when his train collided head-on with another. Now, 
visitors report sightings of a ghostly figure with a lantern in his hand pacing along the track and disappearing into the tunnel. Then there's the story of the brakeman, a ghost believed to be that of a young man who met his demise after a night of heavy drinking. Legend has it that he fell asleep on the tracks, never to awaken again because he was too sauced to wake up before a train ran him over. Then there's the Lavender Lady. Some say they've seen a frail elderly woman walking near the tunnel only for her to vanish into thin air, leaving behind the lingering sense of lavender. Some say she's the spirit of Mary Shea, or Shay, who met her end on those very tracks. There's also the spirit known as the Bully, believed to be the restless spirit of Baldy Keaton, a Moonville resident who liked a good old fist fight. The tale goes that after a scuffle at the saloon, Baldy was found dead on the tracks. As for how he died, no one knows for sure, but now his ghost is said to loom above the tunnel, glaring at unsuspecting visitors and even pelting them with stones. We're starting off the list with the Forbidden City. So this huge palace complex is often said to be a must-see if you're visiting Beijing, but it's also known to be one of the most haunted areas of the city, and possibly in all of China. The Forbidden City was built between 1406 and 1420. It's a massive complex that served as the imperial palace for 24 emperors across the Ming and Qing dynasties. Ordinary people were strictly forbidden from entering, but the thing was, once inside, departure was not permitted. It's a pretty spectacular looking place, but its history is pretty dark as well. The Yungla Emperor who first lived there was quite the guy. He had this huge harem of ladies, but when important visitors came around, he decided that he had to get rid of them. So one night in 1421, he ordered thousands of people from his harem to be killed, and it was not subtle. The story goes that it was about as brutal as it gets, with people literally being torn apart. The entire palace was stained red. Lady Sui, one of his favorite women, kept a diary that talked about these killings, and when Yong La died, she and some other women were hanged. It was apparently Yong La's dying wish. The place is believed to be haunted and cursed. Emperor Yong La's own son, Hong Xi, wanted to move the court somewhere else, but he suddenly died less than a year later. And visitors now say there's a dark, lingering energy in the Forbidden City. Some will say they have this overwhelming feeling of sadness or uneasiness. And people have said to see ghosts, like the White Lady, for example, a tormented spirit constantly on the run from a ghostly soldier attempting to kill her. Some say they've also heard the eerie sounds of phantom scream and swords clashing in the night. Next on the list, we have Fengdu Ghost City, which sits along the Yangtze River. This place has a chilling history that spans over two millennia. So legend has it that during the Eastern Han Dynasty, two imperial officials, Ying Shansheng and Wang Fanping, were seeking immortality through Taoist practices on top of the nearby Ming Mountain. Their combined names ominously translated to the King of Hell, as they allegedly dragged unsuspecting villagers into the underworld. Now today, the area is said to have a bit of an eerie atmosphere. It's full of temples and shrines devoted to the afterlife. Paintings and sculptures in the temples depict scenes of souls undergoing torment for their earthly sins. But... The place looks absolutely spectacular, from images I've seen online anyway. I mean, just look at this. Looks like something straight out of a fantasy movie. We just don't have anything like this over here in Canada or the US. Uh, yeah, definitely adding this to my bucket list. Next, we have the Chiu Mansion in Shanghai. Now, you can't really call Shanghai a small town, I know, but uh, I couldn't help it. I had to talk about this place. Talking about your standard hauntings all the time gets a little too samey-samey, but this old abandoned mansion is said to be haunted by the spirits of exotic animals and they don't play around like human ghosts do. These animal ghosts uh, have been known to attack. During World War I, the price of dye skyrocketed, and two migrant brothers, having just moved to Shanghai in hopes of starting a better life, ended up striking it rich when they happened across a large warehouse full of paint cans. They became overnight millionaires, and with their newfound wealth, 
they constructed two mansions in the heart of Shanghai. They also purchased a number of animals, tigers, peacocks, crocodiles. And for a while, the brothers were living it big. But at some point, they just vanished. Some say they were eaten by one of their pets, but nobody knows for sure. Their mansions fell into disrepair and their animals were sold off or eaten. One of the mansions ended up being demolished. The other was moved in the 2000s. And it was at this time that stories started coming out about construction workers rushing into the nearby hospital with bite marks, claiming to have been bitten by wild animals. They had very real bite marks, but no animals were ever found on the grounds. It was very spooky. Next up is Dead Fengmen Village. The Dead Fengmen Village in the outskirts of Chinyang City has a very ominous reputation. It's often dubbed as a ghost village. For starters, because nobody lives there anymore, but that's not the only reason. The ghost village is surrounded by majestic mountains with a tranquil river flowing nearby. What's left of the village are the remnants of 39 buildings with over 200 rooms built in the architectural styles of China's Ming and Qing dynasties. It sounds pretty picturesque, but there are some pretty creepy stories about this area. First, there's the tale of the wooden armchair. Right in the middle of the village sits a small wooden chair, and legend has it that anyone who takes a seat on it meets a mysterious and untimely death. Then there's the story of a hiker who would often camp along the nearby river, and this story is really uh, kind of creepy. One night, he decided he'd play a little, you know, harmless prank on his friends. He ventured towards the village and called out his friends' names into the darkness, trying to freak them out but he didn't expect to hear what he heard next. It was an unfamiliar voice, but not only did he not recognize the voice, it also just didn't sound human, not quite anyway. And it was too close. And the worst part was the gloomy voice was calling out his name. China is home to one of the five famous death valleys of the world, the Gate of Hell and the Kunlun Mountains. Legend has it that anyone who ventures into the Death Valley never makes it out alive, and it's easy to see how that legend got started. The area really is dangerous. It's full of wildlife, some of it not too friendly to humans. The terrain is rugged and vast, and there's evidence of death everywhere. Tons of animal carcasses and bones litter the ground. There are also things that have been left behind by people who never made it out alive. It does look to have a desolate, hellish vibe about it. So why all this death surrounding the valley? Well, scientists checked it out and found something pretty strange. The valley has abnormally high levels of magnetism, and you know what that means? Lightning strikes. Lots of them. All right, you want to talk about some spooky looking places, look no further than the abandoned Fushan tunnels in Qingdao. These things look right out of a nightmare. So these tunnels were once used by German colonists who arrived in 1898. During World War II, though, they were repurposed by the Japanese as underground fortifications and storage facilities. And today, the Fushan tunnels are still there, shadowy labyrinths beneath the earth. They look like bunkers built for the apocalypse. Oppressive, dark, and isolating. It's said to be incredibly eerie exploring these tunnels. The air is cold and clammy. The walls are damp. And obviously, it's dark. It's the perfect atmosphere for a ghost story. It's easy to imagine the ghosts of soldiers peeking out from the shadows. And that's not even to mention the very real danger of running into very real and very living sketchy people who could be hiding in these tunnels. Next on the list, we have another ghost town, Ho Tu Wan. Ho Tu Wan really is like a scene from a post-apocalyptic movie set. It sits on Shengshan Island, just a stone's throw away from Shanghai. It's an abandoned fishing village and one of the best examples I've ever seen of nature just reclaiming a place. It's actually kind of beautiful. Once upon a time, Ho Tu Wan was a bustling village full of fishermen and their families, but as time passed and economic opportunities shifted, residents started to leave, leaving behind their homes, schools, even some personal belongings. Most of the village still stands today. Only the buildings are engulfed by greenery. Nature has really taken over here. Everything is covered with vines and foliage that wind their way around the decaying homes and buildings. 
Just like with any ghost town, it's definitely eerie, but it's also become a bit of a tourist hotspot. Photographers and urban explorers come to the place a lot, and I can definitely see why. It has this surreal beauty to it. The Wuhan Yangtze River Bridge, like with many old bridges, has a storied past, and it has its own ghostly legend. The bridge is said to be haunted by a ghostly lady in white who met a heart-wrenching fate on this bridge. As the story goes, she was deeply in love with her partner, but when her lover left her, she became so overcome with grief and despair that she decided to take her own life by leaping from the bridge into the dark waters below. Since then, it's said that her tormented spirit still roams the bridge, clad in a flowing white gown. Some claim to have seen a crying woman wandering along the bridge at night. One story goes that a man was driving along the bridge late at night. He saw a woman walking along, along the bridge in the distance, but even from far away, he could hear her wailing. He drove up and pulled over, rolled down his window to ask her if she needed any help. But when the woman turned to face him, he hit the gas and flew out of there. Her eyes were bloodshot and hate-filled, and she began rushing towards the car. As the man drove off, he was almost too scared to look back in his side mirror, but when he did, the woman had vanished. We have the city of Shengde, which is home to one of the most haunted hotels in China, the Yushan Fan Dian Hotel. So this hotel looking over the Yangtze River is said to be haunted by all sorts of eerie spirits and ghosts. Legend has it that the hotel was built on cursed grounds, where restless souls wander aimlessly. Guests who have stayed here report hearing strange noises, seeing mysterious shadows, and feeling an eerie presence lurking in the hallways. One of the most famous stories revolves around a tragic love affair that ended in heartbreak and death, and it's said that the spirits of these lovers still roam the hotel, searching for each other in the afterlife. It's also believed that Empress Dowager Zerzi from the Qing dynasties haunts this place, keeping an eye on her former gardens and occasionally showing up on the eighth floor. And we're finishing off the list with the city of Nanjing. So Nanjing was the site of one of the worst atrocities in recent history. The Nanjing was a horrific event that occurred during World War II in the Chinese city of Nanjing. Japanese forces invaded in 1937, and not only were there mass killings, but many were brutalized and tormented. There was also looting and destruction of property. The civilian population, including women, the young, and the elderly, suffered at the hands of the invading troops. The exact number of casualties is still debated, but it's estimated that hundreds of thousands of people were killed, and many more were subjected to unspeakable acts of violence. It's one of the darkest chapters in China and Japan's history, and the remnants of that event are still said to be felt here to this very day. And it makes sense. In the grand scheme of things, 1937, really not that long ago. If you enjoyed this video about creepy small towns, then you have to check out this video next. It's about historical photos that were banned only until recently. Click the video now to find out more. You don't want to miss this video.